uh, Pat Roy. Some of you may be familiar with the Jonathan Park series. Anybody homeschoolers that are familiar with that? I know our, our children who homeschool also are very familiar with that. He is the producer, he and his family produced that, and he's in the business of producing uh, presentations like that, that will help arm kids with information they need in order to defend his faith. He's been in this business for more than 20 years, working with ICR, and uh, now with uh, Genesis Apologetics, and uh, so he goes all around speaking on that very topic and explaining how we can defend our faith. And uh, certainly the w one big piece of that is to look at what evolutionists are using as arguments to defend what they believe. D is that good science? And Pat is going to answer that. Pat, why don't you come up and share with us? Let's just... Good evening. Hey, I'm so excited to see all that's going on with the creation movement here. I mean, this is amazing. And the, uh, the apologetics forum, I am just amazed. So uh, I am so uh, grateful for what God has been doing to reach out in this area. Well, let's start by praying. Dear Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity. And Father, I pray that you'd be with me tonight. Father, I pray that you'd help me to speak with passion. And Father, help me to share things that are helpful tonight. God, I just pray that you'd be glorified through our time together. I just pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, greetings from sunny California. I didn't know water could get hard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Genesis Apologetics. We are a fairly new organization, and we're committed to reaching teenagers with the scientific case against evolution. And the reason we do that is because more than half of students will reject their faith by the time they're done with college. More than half. Isn't that a horrible statistic? Now what's interesting is, while I praise God for this church and your pastor here and the apologetics forum, I mean, they know, they believe that Genesis is key to the rest of the scriptures. But most churches, capital M, do not believe that way. Most do not. I talk to a lot of pastors, a lot of youth directors who just feel like it's a side issue and it's not important. So praise God for you guys meeting here and for this church and for uh, everything that's going on here in this area. I'm just grateful for it. Well, Genesis Apologetics, we wanted to reach teens and we figured one of the best ways to do that was to dive into the textbooks being used in public schools and that was a lot of fun. We put together a project where we actually went through the textbooks and we identified all of the different evolutionary teaching in those textbooks, and we found out that there was 11 basic tenets of evolution that they're teaching in those textbooks. And then we wanted to make a video series because we realized most teens are probably not going to read a book, okay? So we decided to make a video series, and we hired two young people to host uh, the video series, and it's called Debunking Evolution. And the fun thing I love about it is the young hosts actually hold up the textbooks and they turn to the actual charts and diagrams and actually debunk the information being used in the textbooks. Now what's fun about that is I've, I've been speaking to a lot of youth groups lately, and so many times when I have it up on the screen, I've had kids go, that's the book I'm using. And so that was our goal, was to debunk the very information that they're learning in public schools. Well now, we wanted to put together a commercial to uh, advertise debunking evolution. So we put together a YouTube video just to get people excited about it. And we posted on Facebook and probably within just a few hours, we had thousands and thousands of, uh, of people viewing it and also all kinds of comments. All the Christians were like, yeah, but all the evolutionists were very angry at us. And the reason they were angry is because we were basically calling evolution a faith began to occur to us how many things you have to believe uh, in faith, in blind faith, to believe evolution. And so anyway, they got pretty angry about it. I spent a lot of time just going back and forth on Facebook with a bunch of different people as we were debating, and I'll tell you about that 
in just a minute. I want to show you that commercial, but before I do, I want to follow up on the, uh, the, the uh, video spot that you saw out on the college campus. Here's what I found when I was out there. I've heard that statistic so many times that more than half will reject their faith. I hate that statistic. I wanted to find out if it was true, so that's why we took the camera and the microphone out to the college campus. We actually went out there a few different days on a few different times, and that's what I found was what those students were saying. You know, we always turned off the camera after, uh, after we were done, and I talked to the students. <clears throat> Here's some of the questions I asked them. How long did it take from the time you started college until the time you rejected your faith? You know what the answer was? Three to six months. The next question I asked was, what was the thing, what was the thing that convinced you that evolution was true and that you could no longer trust God's word? You know what their answer was? Hmm, not sure. Wow, you just rejected everything that you were raised with? And you can't even give me a specific reason why? It's because they were overwhelmed by their professors talking about evolution and the truth of evolution that they finally just said, I don't think I can trust God's word anymore. By the way, everybody that was on the screen, did you catch this? Everyone that was on the screen was actually raised in a Christian home, went to youth group, and attended church. It was very really sad. Matter of fact, every time I watch this, I pray for some of those students. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Anyway, can I show you the commercial that we made real quick? I call this the creationist dream. At night, when I'm having a wonderful dream, this is what I'm dreaming of. I know that the last two weeks that we've been talking about evolution has been really tough for some of you. I understand that some of you are raised in families that don't believe in evolution for religious reasons. But in my class, I try to teach you to think for yourself. Are there any questions? No questions? Kayla, you've been unusually quiet. You always have challenges for me. Uh, no, that's okay. But, but, but I know there's a God. I felt him. You can't explain my entire faith away with just a couple of chapters from the science book. Mark, feelings can be compelling, but also very misleading. Now, I don't mind if you have faith in your God, but science doesn't require faith. It requires evidence. Anyone else? Well, it seems to me that that's just what's missing from the whole idea of evolution. What's missing? Evidence. Evidence is missing. It just seems that it takes much more faith to believe in evolution than to believe in a designer. Do you have any examples? Well, how about when the textbook talks about the law of biogenesis, how life cannot come from non-life, but then in the next chapter it talks about how all life sprung from non-living material. And then it talks about mutation and natural selection and how it can change one animal into another, but mutation only loses information and natural selection can only choose from what's there. So how does a simple living organism turn into something like us? I mean, you have to think about like the complexity of the human eye and how we could never design something like that or how, how the human body can heal itself. I just don't understand how some half pound insect eating shrew that somehow dodged whatever killed the dinosaurs could evolve from ape to ape man over millions of unseen years and then poof, you have humans. If evolution were true, we'd have millions of in-between creatures running around everywhere, right? And all of the in-between fossils could fit in the back of my Prius. And you know what else? I just don't understand how all of this started. I mean, you say that science doesn't rely on faith, but evolution requires faith. Faith that everything just burst out of nothing, that gas clouds collapsed and turned into stars, and all this stuff just collided around the sun to create planets, including Earth, that is just the right distance away from the sun to sustain life. It requires faith to believe that living organisms created male and female, crawled out of the water, and then magically became land-dwelling animals, which then became humans, all without intelligence or design. I just think it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe that all the design, marvelous design around us points to a designer. And 
Now I'm just rambling, so does anyone else have a question? Stand strong in your faith. Visit debunkevolution.com. There you go, a creationist dream, right? A girl standing up for her faith. Woo! <laughs> you know, I've talked to a lot of high school students over this last year. We've been traveling around, and I've just been asking students what it's like in the classroom. And you know, that's not too far from the truth. I've heard a lot of times that teachers will say something right at the start of class. How many of you believe in God? By the end of the semester, you won't be saying that anymore. I've heard those stories over and over again. Here's the other thing I've heard, is that when the teacher starts it now, they're good teachers, and there's also Christian teachers. I understand that. But when the teachers begin coming on strong with evolution, <clears throat> and nobody says anything and just sits there, it's almost like they have godlike powers as they talk about the theory of evolution, right? And students are just quiet. And Christian students start to doubt their faith, and research shows that every day, thousands of students are rejecting their faith over that kind of stuff. Here's the other thing that I've asked students is, well, what do you do when the teacher's teaching and everybody's quiet? They say, well, we're all a little intimidated. We don't want to say anything. Here's the other thing we found out is that if a student just raises their hand and just asks a question, it all of a sudden breaks the spell. It's like they get to see that the teacher doesn't know it all. The other thing that we've learned is that when one student asks a question, other students feel like they can start asking questions. And so it's neat that uh, just the power of a question. Now, students have said, I don't want to ask questions because I'm going to get in a debate with my teacher. Well, here's what I told them is, hey, listen, if your teacher wants to start debating, you say, listen, I don't want to debate. You're the teacher. I'm the student. I just want to know the answer to my question. So what are some questions you can ask? Just what things that she was talking about. The one that I love is how did non-living materials become alive? Dinosaurs evolved into birds. Well, how did their scales become feathers? How did their arms become wings? How did dinosaurs learn to fly? Did one jump off a cliff and then the next one went a little further? And the next one went a little further? I mean, how does that happen? See, there's lots of questions you can ask. Now, we always encourage students to ask respectfully and politely, but to ask questions if they can be courageous enough just to ask questions. Well, when that was on uh, Facebook, I got in a dialogue with one guy, and he said, Oh, you Christians, you're so religious. I only believe in observable science. I said, Hey, that's great. I said, But do you realize you believe in religion too? I don't believe in religion. Well, what's the definition of religion? It's a belief about the uh, origin and meaning of the universe. Okay? Does evolution qualify as religion? It does. So I pointed that out and, oh no, I only believe in observable science. I said, okay, that's great. Can you just tell me what observed science shows how non-living materials became alive? And the guy said, you're so religious. No, no, just tell me. I know you believe only in observable science. Tell me what you've observed to show that non-living material can become alive. You know what the guy finally said? He said, well, science hasn't answered that one yet. Now, get this. If they don't even know how life started, what's the whole evolution thing even about anyway, right? So I said, do you still believe that that happened? He goes, well, we know it happened because we see life all around us. So I said, aha, you believe something in faith that you have no observable science for. And all of a sudden, it went quiet. And that's true. Question for you. Are the evolutionists the bad guys? Are they the enemies? No. They're just humans like us, right? They need a savior just like we do. They're not the enemies. They're not the bad guys. We don't fight against flesh and blood, right? I have people ask me all the time, Pat, what's the apologetic that you can give to an evolutionist that will make them fall down and cry like a baby and accept the Lord? Right? Do you realize it's a spiritual thing, right? It's their religion versus our religion, our science versus it. It's a spiritual thing, right? In fact, Romans chapter 1, I know you guys know this, but what a great creation verse. Romans chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there with me if you want. I know many of you know the scripture by heart. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Wow! They know the truth, but they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Does that mean that you can take the most staunch atheist, and if you could look into his heart of hearts, he knows there's a creator? That's what this is saying. And therefore, they are without excuse. That's amazing. I'm going to tell you one more story about being out on the high school campus. I used to go out to high school campuses all of the time down in San Diego. And if this was the uh, campus line right there, the border of the campus, I would stand with my little toesies right there. That way, when the yard duty guy would come out and go, hey, you can't do that, I'd go, ah, 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 look where my toesies are. <laughs> and I would, I would call out to the kids, and I would get a whole group of kids around me. They love talking about this stuff. And they didn't know if I was a creationist or an evolutionist. And so the first thing I'd say is, how many of you believe that you evolved? Here's what I found. A few kids, loud and proud. Boom. How many of you believe that you were created with a purpose? Most kids. Even the non-Christian kids. So I would start talking to them, and here's my premise. It's nothing scientific. This is just based on my time at high school campuses. I believe that most young people inherently know that they were created with a purpose, that they were created by somebody, and that there's some reason that they're alive. It's not till you go to the college campus and you saw what happens there. And I've seen that happen over and over again. So here's the exciting thing. If the change happens between high school and the start of college, if most students inherently believe that there's purpose and that they were created, then our job's easy, right? Now we just come alongside them and say, you're right, you do have purpose, and let me tell you about all the evidence that goes totally along with that. Then we're just giving them the evidence for what they already believe. But if you wait till after college, then you've got to go back and reprogram what they've learned. Well, Genesis Apologetics has put together this video series and books uh, called Debunking Evolution. It was so much fun. We went through the textbooks and checked them out. And here's the topics we found that they were teaching students. And I've got to turn on my remote. There we go. So those are the things that we found were the main tenets of evolution that were being taught in public high schools. Now, my job is to run through all of these in the next uh, 35 minutes. How many of you think we're going to make it through all of these? You have more faith than I thought. I don't think we're going to make it, but we're going to give it a try. Now, listen, I know a bunch of you could come up here and probably teach this lesson better than I do. So many of you know the whole Genesis apologetics even better than I do, but what I hope I can serve tonight is to at least take you into textbook land and show you what they're teaching in textbooks and then how we're de debunking them, okay? So the first one is deep time. Okay, so this is taken from this book right here. Evolution takes a long time. This is actually a, a, a clip right from this book. Evolution takes a long time. If life has evolved, then the Earth must be very old. Hutton and Lyell argued that the Earth was indeed very old, that technology in their day couldn't determine just how old. Half a century after Darwin published his theory, however, physicists discovered radioactivity. Geologists now use radioactivity to establish the, ra of the age of certain rocks and fossils. Now listen to what they say here. This is really interesting. This kind of data could have shown the Earth is young. If that had happened, Darwin's ideas would have been refuted and abandoned. Whoa. Instead, radioactive dating indicates that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, plenty of time for evolution by natural selection to take place. Wow. They're saying that they need the millions of years, right? That's really incredible. They say that if the Earth was proven to be young, Darwin's ideas would be abandoned. You ready for the little secret? Many of you know that mutations lose information, and natural selection can only choose from what's there. The real secret is that time is actually their enemy, 
not their friend because we're actually devolving. We're getting worse and worse. So the millions of years would actually be even more of a problem for them. So listen, so much of it lies on, uh, is, is built upon the foundation of radioisotope dating, radioactivity, radiometric dating to establish the age of different, earth, uh, different rocks. As you know, they usually date fossils by what rocks they're found in. Okay, and those layers are dated by all that. Everything, the whole foundation of dating is built, built on radiometric dating, but over and over again, we've seen that radiometric dating just does not work. A lava flow in a volcano of the North Island of New Zealand that happened in 1954 was dated to be 3.5 million years old. Wow, that's really off. A volcanic bomb that blew out of Mount Stromboli in Italy in 1963 was dated to 2.4 million years old. And that dated much older than it really was. A 10-year-old rock from Mount St. Helens Lava Dome dated to 350,000 years and older. If we can't trust radiometric dating on rocks that we can see formed, then how can we trust radiometric dating on rocks that we can see formed? Okay, I forgot to mention, that's a clip from the Debunking Evolution series. And that was John and Jane, our two uh, hosts of that series. So, great point, right? If radiometric fails on rocks that we know how old they are, why do we keep trusting them on rocks that we don't know how old they are? You see the problem with that? In fact, again and again, radiometric dating has been shown not to work, and yet that's a foundation for so much of the old Earth thinking. Dr. Russ Humphreys, uh, I'm sure many of you guys know Dr. Russ Humphreys, a physicist, used to work for Sandia National Laboratories. One time I was interviewing him, and he said this statement. He said, 90% of the indicators that we could use to know the age of the Earth, 90% of them clearly show the Earth to be young. Only 10% are reinterpreted to show that the Earth is old. Wow. And then he goes through and talks about things like the amount of salt entering the ocean, the amount of erosion that's going on, the, uh, how fast the moon is receding from orbit from the Earth, uh, recorded history, recorded known farming. When you go through and look at all the data, it clearly shows the Earth to be much younger than they believe it is, and it's only 10% that shows it to be old, and a lot of that was based on radiometric dating. So dating just falls, and wouldn't it be neat if the evolutionists went along with what they said in the textbook, and then, therefore, we should abandon Darwin, right? Another concept we found in the textbooks was uniformitarianism. Geologists make inferences based on the principle of uniformitarianism. This principle states that the same processes that operate today operated in the past. And so basically what that means is we can look at a river carving a canyon, we can figure out how quickly it's eroding the canyon, and then we should be able to wind things backwards and find out how long it took for that river to carve the canyon. And when you do that, big canyons like the Grand Canyon turn out to be millions and millions of years old, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had an experiment where we could do a, a great experiment to find out if things could form very rapidly or if it took millions of years to form canyons like that? Wouldn't it be great if we had an experiment like that? God actually did one for us. That's incredible, huh? And that was the small volcano of Mount St. Helens. What power God demonstrates even in a small volcano. The Bible says that God touches the mountains with his fingers, finger and they smoke. Wow, God is powerful. Well, at Mount St. Helens, some amazing things happened. In just a matter of hours, it laid down 200 layers. Over a few months, it carved these great canyon systems. Now, evolutionists I've talked to say, well, yeah, it carved it through soft material. There's a spot in, in Mount St. Helens where it carves through 700 feet of solid rock in just a few months. 
The power is incredible. And all of a sudden, when we look at things like this, and we see that they happen in hours and days and weeks and months, we no longer have to look at the Grand Canyon and say that took millions and millions of years. Isn't it amazing how God sent Mount St. Helens to set up the experiment for us? Well, a few months back, we wanted to survey young people to find out what they thought was the best evidence for evolution. So we hired a group by the name of Polefish, and what Polefish did was when somebody was on Amazon.com checking out their, uh, their products, a little survey came up for students between 14 and 24. And we asked the question, even though you might not believe in evolution, what do you believe to be the best proof for evolution? We got answers from both non-Christians and Christian kids, and believe it or not, the answers were pretty much identical for both groups, and we asked them what they thought was the absolute best evidence for evolution. The number one evidence that they gave was human evolution, the transition from an ape-like creature to uh, humans. That's what they thought was, was the best uh, answer. So again, back to the textbooks. This is from this particular textbook here. You can see that uh, we've got Homo sapiens, we've got Homo erectus, we've got Homo habilis, and Australopithecines. Those are the four that they were presenting in the textbooks. By the way, a fun thing that we got to do is we got to open the textbooks up, look at the different ape men, and then we opened up another textbook and looked at the same ape men fossils. Did you know all the dates were different? It was so much fun that we opened up another one. Whoa, those are different too. So they present these like they're facts, right? And students read these and they go, wow, they know so much about these things. They didn't even have the same dates in the textbooks. It was amazing. So let's look at these. Here's modern humans. We know all about that. Okay, here's how they portray Homo erectus. Homo erectus. Now, Homo erectus had a human body, but the skull was a different shape. And so they said, well, obviously, this is probably an ape-man fossil. Okay, now here's what's, here's what's interesting is look around the room right now. Look at how many different skull shapes. As a matter of fact, I'm standing right here looking at you guys. It's funny, the audience always thinks they're invisible to the speaker, but I'm, I'm right here. I can see all of you guys really well. And I'm looking at all your, your, your skull shapes, and they're different. Okay? Now, a lot of times evolutionists... When they talk about modern human, they take the average human skull, okay? And that's the one they compare against all of the others is the average skull. But eight men fossils, ones that they say are, are not human, they have the same shapes that modern humans have. It just falls within that average range, okay? One of my favorite creation debaters, one of my good friends, uh, he would debate about eight man fossils all the time, and he had a really elongated skull. And what was amazing is he would turn to debate the evolutionist, and I would see his elongated skull. And I just thought it was so funny. He was debating against ape men, and I said, wow, that's a very long skull that he's got there. So Homo erectus, here's, a, here's some of the different skull shapes that they found that they put into the Homo erectus category. Look how different those are. A lot of variations. They compared those to Australian aborigines, right, modern man, and they found out that they share 14 of the 17 traits found in Homo erectus. Wow. Well, so was Homo erectus on his way to becoming a human? No, he was already a human, right? All right, let's jump back one to Homo habilis. Here's how they portray Homo habilis. Now, in our research, what we found out is evolutionists don't really know what to do with Homo habilis. They're classifying them in lots of different uh, places, but there's a lot of scientists out there that are now classifying Homo habilis as possibly just being an Australopithecine, so we're just going to jump right back to the next one and go right back to the Australopithecines. Can somebody tell me who the most famous Australopithecine is? Lucy, you're exactly right. There she is. You know, I, I completely forgot I have some actual fossil replicas. I should have brought them up here. I can't believe I didn't bring them up there. Uh, it's, it's too late. My, my, my wife is kindly offering to go get them. By the time you get them, we'll be done. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Lucy um, looks just like an ape, but they thought that the, she spent part of her time walking upright. And the reason they did was because they found some footprints that looked like it had a human gait, and they were even on a different country. But they thought it was from the same time period as Lucy. So obviously, Lucy must have walked upright. 
and they liked her knee joint, and uh, they thought maybe her knee gave her ability to walk up, right? Now, here's what they actually found. By the way, it was found by Dr. Donald Johansson in 1974, and here's the skeleton that we have. What do you think about the knee? Now, look at the, uh, look at the actual skull. We've hardly got any of the skull. It's really interesting when you look at the actual fossils. Now, Lucy is part of the Australopithecine um, uh, classification. Oh, I should also mention that her skull, uh, where her spine comes into her skull, is at an angle. Okay, us humans, you know, we kind of a 90 degree, right? But hers was actually at an angle. Does that sound more like walking on all fours or walking upright? All fours, right? By the way, her... Her, her wrist locks into place, like many apes, so that you can walk on all fours. Now, Lucy took quite a beating this uh, summer. There was one announcement that said that this bone right here, now imagine, this is one of their most favorite ape men, right? Hundreds of scientists have been studying this for 40 years. They found out that that actually belongs to a baboon. That just happened, right? So here they've been studying this fossil for so many years, so many scientists studying their favorite fossil, and yet they didn't even have a piece that belonged to her. Very interesting, right? The other thing that happened this summer, summer, which was very ironic, was they were looking at her bones, and you can see that there's different cracks in the bones, and a team of scientists doing CAT scans determined that this particular creature fell out of a tree and died falling just right on their face. Ba-boom! So why is the walking upright ape dying from falling out of a tree? You see the irony of that? Now they've got a rec rescuing device. What they said was, well, she was used to walking upright, so when she got up in the tree, she forgot how to climb. And that's why she fell out of the tree. So it makes sense. Now, <clears throat> we found this interesting YouTube video uh, with Dr. Donald Johansson on it, talking about uh, Lucy. Now they point out that the Australopithecines, that they've actually found 400 specimens. And if you go on YouTube and watch this, you can see that they've got 400 Australopithecines walking towards the camera. Okay? So what's the impression you get when you watch that is, wow, there's 400 of these things. You guys ready to see the entire collection of Australopithecines? Here's the 400 right there. Fits on one table. 35% of them are teeth. That's their collection. That's the 400 Australopithecines walking towards the camera. Now, when students read in their textbooks and they read about 400 specimens and they read about all the different fossils they've got of Australopithecines, they forget to mention that they all fit on one table. Amazing, huh? Well, again, here's how she's depicted a lot of times. Now, what do you notice about her eyes? What color are her eyeballs? White. As a matter of fact, she's really thinking right now. What is she thinking about? Bananas. Look at how thoughtful. Now, did some paleontologists dig up eyeballs? So why are her eyes white? Whenever you see her in a museum or textbooks or in a movie or whatever, she's got those white eyeballs, but what color were they probably? Apes have brownish, dark ones. You know what they're trying to do is they're trying to portray her as looking human-like. Okay, here's what she probably looked like according to answers in Genesis. Wow. So it looks like she was nothing more than just a, an ape-like creature. Okay, here's one of my favorites. This is how they used to portray Neanderthals back in my day. Look at that guy. <laughs> I love the claws and the teeth and everything. That's interesting. Now, back in my day, they believed that Neanderthal was in the transition from an ape-like creature to modern-day humans, okay? But so much has happened <clears throat> that they've reclassified them now because they've learned that they played musical instruments, they buried their dead, they had religious ceremonies, um, they did artwork, and then just this summer, an article came out showing that they were actually digging underground structures. Okay? Very interesting. So they've kind of updated Neanderthal a little bit, and here's what he looks like now. Now what they're saying is there was an ape-like creature. We split off, and they split off. 
And then there was an article that came out this summer that said the reason that we outdid the Neanderthals is because we domesticated dogs. That was the article that came out this summer, okay? Very interesting. Well, here's the thing that solved it, in my opinion, is here is a cave in Israel, and in this cave, they found out that Neanderthals were living with modern humans and having families with modern humans. At that point, it's pretty much settled. If they're having families together, they're just modern humans, right? So what we found is that they find ape fossils, they find human fossils, they try and make the humans look more ape-like, make the apes look more human-like, but they've got zero in between. Very interesting. The Bible says this, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. <coughs> Okay, we are doing well. We've still got a bit of time. Let's hit just a few more of these, okay? Here's another one we found in the textbook is natural selection. They define natural selection from this textbook right here as being natural selection is the process by which organisms with variations most suited to their local environment survive and leave more offspring. So here we've got a bird and there's grasshoppers on a lawn. There's the green ones and the yellow ones. The bird is eating the yellow ones because you can see them better. So there we've got a great proof of evolution, right? Grasshoppers are becoming green. Well, what happens when the uh, lawn dies and becomes yellow, then what happens to the grasshoppers? They go back the other direction, right? But they're still grasshoppers. So it's just going back and forth in color, right? Well, I want to play another clip for you from uh, Debunking Evolution that talks about natural selection. Evolutionists believe natural selection figured out how to design an eye. But how? It would have to build and preserve over who knows how many generations, hundreds of complicated interacting eye parts, including proteins that were all useless until the whole package was eventually assembled. How'd it know to engineer animals for flight? Or a navigation system so tiny it can fit in the head of a monarch butterfly, which is smaller than a pin? How'd it wire a human brain that's far more complicated than our best computers if it is a totally blind process with no goal or purpose in view? You're right. Natural selection is just a process. It doesn't have a brain. It can't think or design. It had no foreknowledge of what it was trying to accomplish. And yet, coupled with mutations, it's been assigned godlike powers to create things way beyond man's understanding. Yes! It's like they've replaced God's power with random mutations and natural selection. As the textbook points out, it favors a creature's overall ability to survive, but the actual changes are happening deep down in the creature on a microscopic level inside the genes. Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying that when certain individuals die, all their genes just go away? Meaning that natural selection has no power in selecting individual genes? Well, it can't see genes, just whole organisms. So basically the point he was making at the end is natural selection can either choose to keep or, uh, or get rid of a, a whole individual, right? But where are the changes happening? They're happening down on the molecular level. Natural selection can't see that. Natural selection can't say, I'm going to keep these mutations but not these mutations. You see, natural selection does not have the power they say. And even worse for them, there's some fruit flies. I like to show these because evolutionists are always bombarding fruit flies with radiation because they can study them very quickly through many generations and so they cause these little guys to mutate. So here's some pictures of some mutant fruit flies. This guy's missing his wings. This guy's wings are kind of shriveled. Um, you can see one wing's uh, the other uh, bigger than that wing. Look at these little wings on that one. And so and here's a normal fruit fly. If you were out in nature, which one of these flies would survive the best? The mutant or the normal one? The normal one. That's right. God has actually designed natural selection to keep a population pure. It does the opposite of what evolution says. Well, we talked about mutations. Let's take a look at that very quickly. Um, is adaptation real? They talk about adaptation all the time in the textbooks. Is adaptation a real thing? A lot of times when I ask um, Christian students that, they don't know the answer to that, but the answer is yes. Here's a uh, marine iguana, and here's a land iguana, like what we find on the Galapagos Islands. Those probably came from the same kind, and look at the variety that God programmed into them. 
Okay, so back to the textbook. They say the sources of change, genetic variation, they name two main sources in the textbook. One is mutations, and the other one is genetic recombination. Okay, so those are the two main sources. Now remember, for an evolutionist, they believe that any change is evolution. Okay, but those are the two sources that they mention, mutation and genetic recombination. Here's what they say about mutations in this textbook. Some mutations, such as those that cause genetic diseases, may be lethal. Other mutations may lower fitness by decreasing an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. And then check this out. Still, other mutations may improve an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. So they're saying mutations are a bad thing. They can kill something. They can make it worse off. But in some cases, it actually makes an organism better. Get what they're saying. To go from the first life all the way up to complex human beings, mutations are what wrote that entire genetic code. Wow! Well, what's the best example they can give of this? In this particular textbook, here it was. Over the past 20 years, mutations in the mosquito genome have made many African mosquitoes resistant to the chemical pesticides once used to control them. Wow! Mosquitoes becoming more resistant to pesticides? Now, I talked to somebody, and they told me that that's a mutation that still causes a loss of information in the mosquito, which causes their enzyme production to go out of control. So it's a bad thing. But one of the side benefits is it becomes more resistant to pesticides. That's the example they used to talk about how a simple cell as the first life became a complex human being. That's their example? Wow. Okay, well, back to the textbook. They said the other one is genetic recomb recombination. Okay, so we each have a mom and a dad, and we get genes from both of them, and we get to express this different variety. In fact, as we look around the room, again, we all look so different. It's amazing how different we look. Well, it's like dice. If I had dice, two of them, what's the lowest number I could roll? Right, what's the most I could roll? Right. The variety is already programmed into the dice. And they express the variety, but they've got a limit. I can never roll 13, right? And I can never roll 1. And that's what we see going on is things like with dogs. We see that uh, there's this great variety of dogs, and yet that probably came from a, a one single dog kind. OK, we've got a little bit of time left. Let's keep going. The other thing that they present is fossils, obviously, in the textbooks. If evolution was true, millions of years of simple life becoming more and more complex, we should see that in the fossil record. We should see that things are very simple at the bottom, becoming more and more complex. But we don't see that. We see things completely out of order from that. We don't see that in reality. Here's the other thing about the fossil record. If that happened, if millions of years of millions of animals turned into millions of other things, and we've got hundreds of thousands of fossils in the museums, we should have tons and tons of transitional fossils. But there's only two really favorite ones that they like a lot. Okay? They should be able to produce many of these things, but one of them is Archaeopteryx. Okay? They think this is a transition between uh, dinosaurs to birds. But here's the problem. is scientists found what appears to be a crow-sized bird in rock layers uh, lower than Archaeopteryx. Whoops. Wait, if that was turning into a bird, but there's always a, already a bird below it, that's a big problem, right? So many evolutionists now don't even accept Archaeopteryx as being a transitional fossil. Here's another one that came out, was Tiktaalik. I like Tiktaalik because of its fins here. They think, wow, those were probably on their way to becoming legs, right? So this is exciting. They thought this was the transition from a fish to a four-legged tetrapod that was going to crawl out on land. Okay, And I studied this guy quite a bit. It's a really interesting fossil. <clears throat> in 2010, scientists announced in the journal Nature that they had found four-legged footprints of a land creature in Poland that are supposedly 10 million years older than Tiktaalik. Wow, if he's turning into a four-legged creature, but you've already got four-legged creatures earlier in the fossil record, there goes Tiktaalik. So it's really interesting that those are the the best two that they, can, uh, that they can give us. OK, let's talk about common ancestors. 
This was another thing we found in the textbooks. We see uh, charts like this all over the place in textbooks. Very interesting. Now look what this textbook said <clears throat> about this. By the way, these are called cladograms. Cladograms. They're trying to draw that evolutionary tree of what animal evolved into other animals. By the way, if you're an evolutionist, think about what a challenge you've got. You have got to try and draw a tree that shows how a single animal evolved into everything on planet Earth. How hard of a job would that be? Can you imagine that? So that's what they're trying to do. So listen to what this textbook said. Remember that modern evolutionary classification is a rapidly changing science with a difficult goal. Yeah? To present all life on a single evolutionary tree. As evolutionary biologists study relationships among taxa, they regularly change not only the way organisms are grouped, but also sometimes the names of groups. Remember that cladograms, yeah, check this out. Remember that cladograms are visual presentations of hypotheses about relationships and not hard and fast facts. Wow, they said that right in the textbook. <clears throat> not hard, fast facts, right? These are real animals or fossils we've actually discovered. But these branching points are just imaginary lines that represent the hypotheses about which animals evolved from a common ancestor. No facts support them that can't also support different links, or no links. The transitional fossils they represent have never been found. If they were, well, we'd see their pictures here, right? Though evolutionists point to a few examples, there should be thousands. Okay, so Darwinists are trying to draw the evolutionary tree. As creationists, we don't believe in an evolutionary tree. We believe in an orchard. So here's our orchard, the creation orchard, right? Is God created kinds, just like he says in his word. And those kinds, God was so creative that he packed with enough genetic information that they could express variety. So we've got the dog kinds and all their varieties, but just like the dice, they can't change into something else. All the ape-like creatures and all the variety that they express, and humans and all the variety we express. It's the orchard. We can express variety, but one tree can never become another tree. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and, every creeping, uh, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Okay, I think we've got time for just one or two. We're making it further than I thought we were. You guys doing okay? I'm not putting you guys totally to sleep? Okay, good. Homological structures. <clears throat> According to this book, homolo homological, uh, homo homologous structures are structures that share a common ancestry. That is a similar structure in two organisms <clears throat> can be found in the common ancestor of the organisms. Okay, so then they've got actual proof of this. There's the penguin, the alligator, the bat, and the cumin. And as you can see, those obviously came from common ancestors, right? <laughs> so, when you see these common structures, you know that it points back to evolution, a common ancestor. But what do you do when two totally unrelated creatures have a similar thing? like an eye. This is a squid eye, and they found out that it's very similar to a human eye. Well, they would say that a squid and a human are like not related at all, and yet the eye is very similar to, to each other. Okay, so what they say is that eye actually evolved twice. How hard would it be for an eye to evolve in the first place? Impossible. How hard would it be to evolve, evolve twice? Impossible times two. Now they also say that flight evolved four different times. Well, man didn't even learn to fly until, you know, just a couple hundred years ago. So evolution without a brain or thinking about it evolved flight four times? You see, that's impossible times four. So when you think about it, this is some circular reasoning because what they say is similar structures on similar creatures prove evolution. Well, how do we know that things evolved? Because they have similar structures on similar creatures. Okay, then they also say similar structures on different creatures was evolution times two. Now, what do we as Christians, creationists say? 
When we look at similar structures, it's just God using similar designs, right? We're intelligent beings. We do that all the time. There's wheels on skateboards and 747s and cars and carts and wagons, right? So we reuse the same design over and over again, and that looks like it's what, what God has done. So common structures don't point back to a common ancestor. Instead, common structures point to the common creator, the one that they have in common with one another. Okay, next one that they talk about, vestigial structures. Vestigial structures. Dr. Robert Biedersheim uh, made a list of 180 vestigial structures in the human body. A vestigial structure is a structure supposedly that we don't use anymore that's obviously left over from evolution. Okay, so they point out the appendix and the tonsils and a bunch of other ones. He had 180. By the way, at the Scopes trial, this evidence was actually presented at the Scopes trial, but since that time, all the 180 have disappeared off the list. Every structure has been shown to have purpose. There are no vestigial structures. They ought to stop talking about this because it's no longer a valid argument. It's done. Modern technology has shown that there are no leftover uh, structures in our body. Boy, we may make it through uh, all of these. It's incredible. Whale evolution, that's another one we found in the textbook. Whale evolution, what we found out was that they took a bunch of different um, fossils and some imagination, and they lined them all up in an order to make it look like a wolf-like creature evolved into a 35,000-pound whale, okay? So they took these different fossils and lined them up. The first one that they start with in the textbook was an imaginary transitional fossil, and then they show all these fossils building up. So again, let's hear from John and Jane here. What's up with the silverware? Your perfectionism kicking in again? <laughs> no. No, these are arranged in an evolutionary story. See, we start with a knife that eventually evolves a round end to become a spoon. And then over time, some notches form into it and it becomes a spork. And eventually, a fork. I believe a spork may actually be a transitional fossil. It's just not right. I know what you mean. You can't spear a salad and soup just drizzles through. through. So when you line up a theoretical ancestor, a couple of extinct land animals, an extinct sea creature, an extinct whale, and a couple of modern whales, you can tell a pretty good story about how a 100-pound wolf-like creature turned into a 360,000-pound blue whale. But don't make it true. It's true. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Hey, we actually may make it through all of them here. Let's, let's give it a try. We're almost there. Extinction was another thing that we found in the textbook. <clears throat> Here's what they said about extinction. Until recently, researchers looked for a single cause for each mass extinction. Many mass extinctions, however, were probably caused by several factors working in combination volcanic eruptions, moving continents, and changing sea levels. Okay, so they believe in five major extinctions, and what they're admitting to is they don't quite know exactly what caused those, but those are probably the things that were factors. Look at that list. That's what we as creationists think were going on during the worldwide flood. Wow, instead of a bunch of mass extinctions, could it have been just a flood? There's a picture of a uh, uh, dinosaurs at uh, Dinosaur National Monument. Here's what it says uh, in Genesis. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Interesting. Matter of fact, uh, we've done some research on all the dinosaur graveyards in the United States. Uh, my wife Sandy and I, when we wrote Jonathan Park, we went to a place called Ghost Ranch. And at Ghost Ranch, I got to go back this summer. It was awesome. At Ghost Ranch, in the museum, they've got this chunk of sediment. And in there are all these, well, it's pieces of Coelophysis dinosaurs. And there's heads and tails and claws. I mean, it looks like somebody took all these Coelophysis and went, Boop, and then poured them out into a, uh, uh, right into the sediment. It was like they were in a blender, right? And they just got chopped up and put in there. 
I asked the paleontologist what caused this, and he said it's a local flood. That's what they say. A local flood killed those dinosaurs. Now, I didn't get to ask him because just as I wanted to, a lady came up and asked this one guy uh, when I was here this, there this past summer, but I wanted to ask him if it's a local flood, the layer that those are found in is called the Shin Lee Formation. The Shin Lee Formation stretches over 600,000 square miles. Is that a local flood? As a matter of fact, we came home from the first time we went there and we did a research, a literature research project, a bunch of us did, and we looked at all the dinosaur graveyards in the United States. Ancient river, ancient sea, mudstone, water, ancient lake, ancient ocean, inland sea. All of them are water, 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 water. And then we looked at uh, uh, Europe, same thing. China, same thing. I'm not a paleontologist, but I started thinking about this. All these guys fly to the meeting and they sit around and they go, what killed the dinosaurs? Well, maybe it was an extraterrestrial impact. Maybe it was climate change. I even heard one that said that they formed cataracts and they couldn't see their prey anymore. There's a hundred extinct, over a hundred extinction theories about how dinosaurs died. Okay, I'm not a scientist, but look, if it was water, 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 maybe what killed the dinosaurs was water. Right? And these dinosaur graveyards, you find tons of animals jumbled inside. There's some places where you find salamanders and fish, uh, birds, um, all kinds of animals from all these different environments all jumbled together in a mess. It's perfect evidence for the worldwide flood. I cannot believe this. You guys are like the first ones in a long time in which I've made it all the way through. So the question is, why creation? Well, we talked about how evolution is a religion, but when you think about it, it's a religion of death. It's millions of years of death, pain, and suffering being our creator. Not only that, but the religion of evolution leads to death. So many people have used it as a justification. Hitler used to hold up skulls in the meetings and show how the Jewish skulls weren't as far evolved as the Aryan race. I talked to an abortion clinic operator, and she said she could justify it because what was being aborted was nothing more than just a blob that was on its way to evolving to become human. Okay, Haeckel's theory. So evolution is the religion of death, but creation, Christianity, is a religion of life, right? God created things perfect, very good. We sinned. God placed a curse on creation, but someday... Christ will restore things to the way they once were. It leads to life. So I want to end with Deuteronomy 13, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore choose life, that, that both thou and thy seed may live. I just want to say just a couple more things, and then I think we're going to do a, a short question and answer. Our debunking evolution series, if you would like to, to watch the videos, I'll tell you how to do it for free. Just go to debunkevolution.com and you can watch them for free. We've also got the full book that you can download for free. And we've also got um, a student guide that goes along with it that you can download for free. And on that website, we've also designed an, uh, an online course that goes through the series. And uh, you can go through and answer questions and take quizzes and all of that, and that's also for free. If you want physical copies, we've got physical copies available at our table back there. So if you want to stop by and see my family after we're done. Okay, we're going to do a question and answer, but I've got to give you a big disclaimer before we do this. I'm not a scientist. I'm a lay person who loves this stuff. I've also interviewed hundreds and hundreds of scientists. Oh, you brought Lucy in? <laughs> oh, my dear wife, you couldn't take that. We weren't showing these. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to ask the first question. What does Lucy's skull look like? Oh, you, the skulls are out there. Do we have a skull? No, okay. Let me just uh, introduce the Q&A time. Yes, sir. Uh, let's give... Uh, 
Pat a, a hand for his presentation. Thank you. A lot of uh, good information. Probably snowed uh, a lot of us that, with that. But uh, there's more in the books that he mentioned there and in the DVD. You can get some of the details from that and in the course that he talked about. But wh while you're thinking of a, another question, we're going to have the men come up. This ministry is supported through the sales of the books and DV DVDs in the back, but also through a free will offering that we take uh, to cover the cost of doing this. And, uh, you know, we, we continue to bring in some good speakers to uh, give you information that you can use to uh, defend what we believe in the faith. So why don't you talk about that, and then we'll take some more questions. And, okay, that sounds yeah. good. Thank you very much. All right, so I talked about Lucy and Lucy's fossils. And uh, I just wanted to show you, these are Lucy's fossils right here. I don't know, can you guys see the stage okay right there? There she is. Here's the bone, by the way, that belonged to the baboon. Okay, so when they talk about Lucy, there she is. And, and we're, we're sure all those bones are from the same skeleton, right? <laughs> I don't know. We found the baboon fossil accidentally in there. Yeah. I don't know. What else will yeah. we, we find? So, okay, so anybody have a question that they would like to ask? Yeah. Speak good and loud. If monkeys and um, apes evolved to humans, why are there still apes and monkeys? That is a great question, and I get asked that a lot, but uh, let me give you the answer. By the way, thanks for thinking through this. I can tell you really think. So what an evolutionist would say is they would say that there was an ape-like creature, so it evolved up to an ape-like creature, and then they believe that apes went on one branch and that we continued on a different one. Okay, so you've got modern humans, and they believe that you've got modern apes and chimps. Okay, so that's why they say that both of them are still around. Okay, speaking of apes and chimps, I want to show you one last... Lucy here. Yes. <laughs> Her question was, you poured them out on the stage? <laughs> now, I broke poor Lucy's jaw here just a couple days ago. But here is Lucy, her skull. The brown parts are what they actually found. And the white part is imagination. There you go. Now, here's a bonobo, and look at uh, the similarity. A bonobo is an ape. Three and a half feet. A little, a little less short than I am. No, <laughs> okay, other questions you may have about uh, Lucy or some other aspect of the 11 pillars that he discussed? He convinced you? Well, if there are, oh, you're just thinking. So anyway, if you don't have a question now, feel free to ask him as we uh, go to the back there. There are tables of resources to look at, and of course there's refreshments for you to enjoy while you look at the resources back there as well. And uh, just to remind you of a few things here. Don't step on Lucy. Nope, I won't step on Lucy. Um, remember that we there are copies of this Fallout DVD, 25 minutes long, and it uh, adds to what Pat was saying in his interview on the campus. So if you want a copy of that and uh, you can pass it on to some of your colleagues, feel free to take one off the apologetics form table. The other thing that we have, I know some of you have this already, is the brochure which describes what we do in the apologetics forum. If you didn't get that last time, feel free to take a few copies. They're in the back table and also on the other tables and uh, pass them out at your church, pass them on to your colleagues who need to know what we're doing in apologetics. And another thing is there on the back table, there is a survey form. If uh, you have a particular topic that is a favorite of yours, in terms of apologetics and you would like to see it discussed, 
mark it down and put it in the box uh, in the back there. Um, and so, the, and then lastly, I want to remind you that next year we're going to have uh, uh, Reverend Jason Carlson speak. He's the president of Christian Mission uh, Ministries uh, International in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, he has spoken at a number of apologetics conferences around the world, and I heard him speak last uh, uh, April in uh, Bellevue. And uh, what I particularly liked about him, uh, him speaking was that he addressed some of the hard questions that skeptics have and even some believers have, such as, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, why is there so much suffering, pain, and evil in the world? That's a question that he's going to address at the breakfast hour on Saturday, January the 22nd. The one he's going to talk about on the forum is the three most important questions facing our culture today. So we're going to hear him speak here on that Friday night. And then before that, on the Thursday, January the 19th, he's going to speak in Anacortes at the church uh, listed here. And that is what's so unique about Christianity? Why is it different from other belief systems in the world? And uh, again, skeptics ask me, and I'm sure they ask you as well, what's different about Christianity? Why, why would I want to believe in what you believe? Give me a reason. So he's going to address those three topics. And on the Saturday morning, we're going to make that a breakfast uh, meeting. And that will be at Grace Academy, which is just down 67th Avenue here. So put that on your calendar, those three dates, a very great speaker that we're bringing in to cover those hard topics. And I'm sure you'll uh, en enjoy what he has to say about them and arm you to be able to defend your faith. So with that, let me just close in a word of prayer. Do you have a And, and in fact, they are available still at different uh, museums. You can buy them, right, the, the replica? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. By the way, if somebody travels around and speaks on creation, Genesis Apologetics and the International Association of Creation, we have a brand new uh, service that we're offering for creation speakers. We've got Lucy's. Uh, we've also got some other replicas that you can borrow and check out and actually use to go out and speak on creation. So yeah. if you're a creation speaker and you're interested, get in contact with us, and maybe you can throw Lucy's fossils on the stage too. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you, Pat, thank you so for much. your ministry. Thank you. thank you. So let, let me close in a and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we come to you again just to thank you for the ministry that Pat and uh, his wife and children have among us. We just ask you just to bless their future ministry as well as they go out sharing about your creation and how it is, uh, we can see how it supports your word. And we just thank you for that. Uh, go before each one and with the uh, inclement weather out there with snow. Uh, we just pray for traveling mercies on each person's way back home. And uh, may what we have learned here May we be able to share that with others who have questions about your creation. And we just thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.